I'm going to be talking about Fake It to Make It, which is a social impact game that I created and released in March of last year. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about my background because it relates to how and why I created this game. So most of what I work on professionally and what I get paid for is learning design, and most of it's in the global health space. Um, so right now, I'm working on immunization training um, with the World Health Organization. Um, some of the screenshots here from courses that I worked on about childhood tuberculosis and about corruption and humanitarian aid and how to prevent it. Um, and I create courses that have very game-like principles in that you start out with a situation. Um, so for example, in that one up there, you have a child who comes in and you're a physician and you need to decide, does this child have tuberculosis? So you have to make decisions about what questions you're going to ask in order to gather information. And then once you gather the information, you have to select which notes are likely to be tuberculosis indicators. When you make incorrect decisions, you get feedback on what choices you made. And I think that this is the best use of online learning, having these practice spaces, because it really gives people a chance to see what they know, what they don't know, and gives them a chance to sort of fill in these gaps in their education. Um, so I think this is good for learning, um, whether it be more traditional stuff like this or in games. So both professionally and personally, um, I'm also incredibly interested in people, and so how we communicate across cultures, and so I was really lucky to be able to spend two years traveling around the world um, with my husband and with our kid. My husband and I both have computer jobs, and so we were able to take our work with us. Um, and we stayed in each of these countries for about a month. And while I won't pretend like this gave us some great insight into the cultures of each of these countries, it did give us a more residential sort of approach to our travel. So we saw more about how people lived and what they ate and what their homes were like than we would have if we had just been on vacation. And this is my son up here. And so this is us at a mosque in India um, where he was asked to be in about 5 million different photos in the space of an afternoon. He is a super friendly kid, so he was pretty, pretty happy to oblige. Um, this is us at a tea ceremony in Japan where they really kindly abbreviated it to fit with a four-year-old's attention span. And this is my husband and I at a home cooking lesson in Morocco. So my son Theo is watching um, cartoons in Arabic in another room because you do not need to understand the language in order to be able to watch cartoons. And this whole trip was an amazing experience. And I know I was super lucky to be able to do this. One of the things that stood out to me the most as I traveled was how warmly we were welcomed into the homes and lives and activities of everyone we met around the world. Ah, click. Ah, click twice. Okay. So at the end of our trip in August 2016, we moved back to Ohio, which is in the United States. Um, I've included a map because it's not one of the most well-known states. Um, this was where my husband and I had both grown up, um, and we moved back there mostly to be around family. We had a young kid. We had never lived there when our kid was around. Um, but I would say that coming back felt like a pretty extreme culture shock, and probably more so than for any of the countries that we visited during our trip. Ah. So, of course, there was a particular event that was happening in 2016 that might have made this even more of a shock. Um, so the 2016, for those of you who don't know, was the end of the presidential election in the United States. Um, spoiler, we elected Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> But after being welcomed around the world, we came back to a country that was becoming less welcoming, that was becoming more fearful, and we just scared of the entire world. And this just conflicted so much with this view of the world that we had just experienced on our trip. And so it would not be a stretch at all to say that I created Fake It to Make It directly as a result of the 2016 election. And so I think there was a lot to be upset about with this election. But one thing that I was very specifically upset about was the amount of fake news that was swirling around on the internet leading up to the election. So these are all fake, by the way, so don't, don't trust them. But people spread this type of false information for lots of inf reasons. So with this game, I wanted to target specifically the people who were spreading this information because they believed the articles were true. So essentially, 
I wanted people to employ a higher level of skepticism when they're reading these potentially misleading articles, and I wanted them to notice when a claim was questionable and fact check it. Because I'm super ambitious, I also wanted people to be able to explain to others how and why fake news is distributed, and I wanted them to maybe even become advocates in、um, stemming the spread of misinformation. So essentially, if someone saw an, a misleading article on Uncle Herbert's Facebook feed, I wanted them to be able to fact check it. I definitely didn't want them to spread it to others, and ideally, I would even like them to post a comment on that article saying why that article is misleading. Maybe not for the sake of Uncle Herbert; it probably won't help him, but for anyone else who might come across that on social media. So, my next question was, why wasn't this happening already? Well, why do people that think that certain fake news articles are legitimate? So one of the reasons is maybe they don't understand just how easy it is for someone with just a little bit of technical expertise to register a domain, set up WordPress on it, and create something that looks fairly legitimate.、Um, most of the fake news sites that were distributing articles leading up to the election were just run on WordPress. They aren't that hard to set up. I could set one up. I didn't. So this is fake. And same, honestly, with the writing of the articles themselves. So people see something that maybe has some pictures and has some quotes from people, lots of specific details, and they think, well, of course it must be true. It has all these details. And so I think just having an understanding that all of this is very easy to fake, that it's easy to put these things together and make something that is not true, even if it might be sort of vaguely based on reality, is really important、um, understanding for people to have. Also fake. And so finally, people don't necessarily understand the financial incentives for creating fake news, mainly through ad revenue.、Um, this is particularly true. Ah, okay, I still have it here, but not there. Okay, yay! Tell me if that happens again. <laughs> okay, so. Um, I really wanted them to understand the profitability. So, especially for people who might be living outside of, say, the United States or outside of Western Europe, where the cost of living is less, and so the money that they're going to earn from these ads is going to go farther. Okay. So, how am I going to do all of this? So, this is an outcome map. Um, so with it, I start out with the high-level outcomes that I want to achieve in the world, and then I figure out what else needs to happen in order to make those high-level outcomes happen. So you can see the two top-level boxes that we already talked about as my ultimate goals for the game. But there's other things that need to happen in order for those to happen. So people need to believe that fake news does exist. They need to understand these financial incentives that we talked about for making fake news. They need to understand how fake news is written and distributed. And even when they're looking at particular articles, I want them to understand some of these techniques that are used. So things like appealing to fear and anger,、um, including elements of truth, including、um, things that people already kind of believe deep in their souls, and so they want to believe. So confirmation bias. So as I mentioned earlier, I engage in more traditional learning design as well, and I use outcome maps for many of my projects because I think it's an excellent way to make sure that what you're asking people to do in the game, or to do in the training, actually matches what you want them to do or understand in the world. So I had really lofty ambitions here with my top two-level box goals. But I didn't think I could do all of it, so I focused on these items in blue at the bottom because these really focus on understanding fake news as a system and how it's distributed. And I felt like if people had this base knowledge, that's enough to sort of nudge them up to the top, and then other people have to do things to help too. So looking at these, I wondered what's the best way for people to get a deep understanding of these systems and techniques. So、as before, my background is in training and learning, and often when we imagine people learning things, it's like we imagine it like this. So they're just going to read something and listen to something, and poof, it's going to be embedded in their brain, ready for them to use in the real world. I mean, the problem with this, though, is that reading something or listening to something is rarely enough for long-term retention, let alone for skill building or behavior change. And so, I pretty. Quickly rejected this approach, as I often do, and looked in more interactive format, so like a game. But what type of game? So this type of game is really popular in the training world. But my issue with games like Jeopardy is that picking questions that are worth a certain amount of money generally has very little to do with 
what you're trying to actually have your people do in the real world. So if you have really well-worded questions, maybe you can help them review things or memorize some basic facts. But unless you're teaching them to participate in a quiz show, then the game mechanics have nothing to do with what you want them to do in the real world. So I don't think this is horrible, but I think in most cases we can do better. So similarly, there's a lot of kids learning games um, on the internet. The challenge isn't necessarily connected um, to the learning goals. So in this game, you move this little guy up and down, and he's collecting letters. Um, but the mechanics, the, what you're actually doing, the challenge of it, has nothing to do with words or literacy. It's just a challenge of just collecting stuff. And so I don't think games like this are horrible. Again, my six-year-old would love to play this game. But I think that in most cases, again, we can do better. And I don't want to spend a lot of time going down the rabbit hole of what a game is and what a game isn't. But for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to talk about the specific type of game that has a goal, and then there's rules that define how you can reach that goal. So golf is a good example. So your goal in golf, as I understand it, is to get the ball into the hole. But you're not allowed to just walk up and put the ball into the hole. Instead, you have to hit the ball with a stick. And you have to do this from some distance away. And there are things in the way, things like sand traps and water, to prevent you from effectively hitting that ball into that hole. And there are skills and strategies that people will learn to so they are better at efficiently hitting that ball into that hole. And it was probably clear, but I don't know anything about golf, so that, that's the end of all my knowledge about golf. But even without more knowledge of golf, I know it would be a lot easier just to walk up and put the, hall, the ball into the hole, just drop it in. But people are willing to practice for thousands and thousands of hours to get better at efficiently working within the rules of the game to meet the goal. And so I think that this is a super powerful aspect of games, is the ability to inspire people to struggle. And so I would argue very strongly that if your goal is to change something, either in your players or the world, that you should be integrating the message or the skills into the game mechanics. So that way, the things that your players are struggling with are going to be the same things that you want to str them to struggle with in the real world people will spend so much time perfecting winning strategies. And because they've been spending all this time struggling, they're more likely to remember what it is they've been struggling with. OK, so back to my outcome map. And I wanted to make these items in blue, the items that the player is struggling with in the game. And so I decided to have them make fake news. So if the player's goal is to make money, um, by making fake news, then yes, they are going to understand the financial um, profitability of fake news. If they are writing their own articles, then they are going to figure out um, how to appeal to emotions and use partial truths and how that can be more profitable. If they're picking sympathetic groups to spread the articles to, then they're going to understand how to use confirmation bias. So for this game, I wove all of the items that I wanted to achieve into the combination of the goal and the mechanics. So I'm going to look at some screenshots of how this played out in the final game. Um, but it is also publicly available. And I'll show the URL at the end. Um, or you can get it on a little card for me. Um, so some of the people who make fake news for people in the United States and Western Europe um, actually live outside of these areas in places where the cost of living is lower. Um, so the money they earn through ads is going to go farther. And they don't necessarily need to earn very much um, in order to make it worthwhile for them to do this. And so I wanted to make that point with the game. And so I set sort of the premise of the game is if you are a teenager in another country who basically just wants to get some music equipment or a deposit on an apartment or a new car. So you have these modest financial goals. You don't really care about the election, but you're like, hey, it's a way to profit and get what it is that I would like. So players then create their first site, and they're introduced to the idea that they're going to be profiting from ad revenues. Um, when thinking about site creation, I again wanted to highlight, it's not that hard to set up WordPress on a site. So the beginning of the game, players build their sites by copying articles from other fake news sites. This is something that absolutely happens. 
Um, and you'll notice that these articles, some of the tags have orange tags. So in this fictional universe, um, there are two political parties. There's the orange party and the purple party. And so some articles and topics are designed to appeal to one party or the other party. Something also that really happens. Um, you can also see, maybe, that each um, article has a believability and a drama score. And so a believable article isn't necessarily true, but it's something that appears true, using some of these things we talked about earlier, from images and quotes and things like that. And then dramatic articles are more likely to spread, so it's something that people care about. They're more likely to want to share with their friends and family. So to write all the fictional headlines, and there's more that you can't see here. I spent a lot of time on actual fake news sites, and then I just tried to sort of abstract them out. So I would take what was upsetting people, um, and so instead of President Obama is Muslim, it's like, proof, the president is a member of this religion. So after they've copied articles, um, it's time for them to plant them um, on social media. So to do this, users first have to pick one of the articles on their site, and for these screenshots, I use the second one. And then they need a social media account to use to share this article. Um, so in this game and in real life, you can either buy existing social media profiles or you can create your own. Um, so in this case, I think I bought the second guy because, oh, you can do those things, yay. But I bought the second guy because he was an orange party leaning profile. He already had friends. Um, so it would look more credible and my article would be more likely to spread. And then finally, the player needs to select where to spread the article. So again, there's different groups that talk about different topics and have different political leanings. Um, so since we bought a profile here, this guy has existing groups. There's also other groups that you can join, and you may or may not be accepted, sort of depending on how your profile leans compared to the group. Um, in this case, the second group, looks pretty good because they really like bashing President Aubergine and the Purple Party, so I planted it there. And then this is sort of the feedback you get based on your choices. So you both see the results in terms of the comments that someone might leave on your article. So in this case, people seem really upset, which is good. Yay, upset people. Um, and then you also see the number of likes, shares, and views that the article receives. And then based on the number of views, you earn ad revenue, so both per article and for the site as a whole. So players have the relative freedom to create the types of sites and articles that they like to. So you could share articles exclusively about really cute cats, if that's what you wanted to do. Um, however, there's a series of intermediate goals and the financial incentives that are baked into the game very much make it more profitable to spread political articles that are highly, um, highly bias towards one side or the other into politically sympathetic groups. And this is not just like my, my opinion, these are the articles that did best. So through this, I want to nudge people towards the idea that if there's an article that is very much appealing to your political biases, it might have been planted there because they know you already have these biases. So after completing several intermediate goals, players unlock the ability to write their own articles in a new interface. Um, so I'm going to walk you through how to write fake news. Please don't do this for real. Um, so first you want to start by selecting out what your article is going to be about. And so this is an article base. Um, so you could start out with just a random tweet or you could start out with something that's popular right now. But the best way to start out in most cases is to start with something that's true. Because if you start with something that's true, people might have seen it on mainstream media, they might have heard about it from a friend, and so your article has instant credibility if you do that. But the problem is, is that if you do this, your article is believable, but it's not necessarily likely to spread as much as it is if it were more dramatic. And so you can pick different slants to sort of twist your article into something that's more dramatic. And so because people like their political biases and like articles that fulfill them, you can pick drama that's either um, suitable to the orange party or the purple party. And so I think in this case, I picked these two, which are encouraging fear of certain people and claiming that taxpayers will have to pay for this because uh, people like to spread articles about both of those things. And as you can see, when I pick that, 
it comes up as topics on the article itself. So you're sort of building the topics that your article is about. And then the drama score also increases because now this is something that people want all their friends and family to see so they can be upset about how horrible President Aubergine and the Purple Party actually are. Okay. Um, you can also see the emotions that this article is targeting, so things like fear, anger, and disgust. Um, again, really good emotions to target if you want something to spread. And then you want to make sure that the article itself looks real. So we started out with a real event, so that definitely helps, and our believability score is already 12. Um, but at the same time, we've added in these extra slants. Um, so we want to make sure that we're supporting those details as well. So you can do things like including just an image of something else makes it look real. People feel like, oh, I can see it. It must be true. You could have a quote by someone um, who does really exist. Maybe it actually is the policeman in a certain town. But you just make up something that that person says. If you are a teenager in another country, you're not going to be worried about this person coming after you for, for putting false words into his or her mouth. Um, so for this one, I selected some believability. It went up. And then you have to write a title. And so for this one, social justice warriors being violent seemed like the right way to go. And then you can see your article on your site. And so you build a site that has lots of articles in it. Each one is earning you money as time goes by. You can also create multiple sites. Um, so I might want to create one site that's targeting the Orange Party and another site that's targeting the Purple Party. And no one will know. And so I can profit off of both of these political biases. So as players advance, they also unlock the concept of trending topics, um, so shown right there. Um, and so if they're targeting their articles to these topics, they're more likely to spread widely. And you might even get some famous people to share your articles, which will help it go even further. Um, and as you see, the trending topics themselves are also aligned to one party or the other, because it's often true that one party cares about one topic more than another at any given moment. So while the game is mostly about fake news as a system versus the impact, um, there is feedback that you get later on that, that sort of starts to touch on the impact. And so if you have an article about how certain people are dangerous, you might eventually see that um, the hate crimes against this group are going up. And I think if I were designing this game today, I would spend more time thinking about how to weave in those impacts um, into the game to make sure those were clear. Okay, so this is my outcome map again, because I think it's important with any social impact game to ask at the end, was it successful? I mean, are you actually seeing the changes in the world that you would like to see? Um, so the game is freely available online. Um, since its launch in March of 2017, it's been played more than 140,000 times from people in 170 different countries. Um, and this is all without any marketing, like formal marketing. It got written up um, and is just spreading for word of mouth. Um, most of the players, I don't know what they do or think after the game. But I do periodically have people write to me, and most often this is teachers who are using the game in their classrooms. And from what I've heard from them, the game has been a great way for their students to more deeply understand fake news as a system, and then often they'll play it individually and then come together and discuss what worked, what didn't, why did this work, how have you seen this in real life, and really tie it to it. So I wasn't necessarily intending this to be something that was used in schools, but it absolutely is being used there, and I'm really excited about that. And it's also been translated to German, um, specifically to be used in schools in Germany. So I don't have more formal data about the impact yet, but I'm partnering with a PhD student um, right now to study the learning impact of the game. So for now, though, you can play the game in either English or German um, using the URLs here. And I have little cards with them on it as well. Um, I'm working on new games about more political propaganda and corporate propaganda, um, but I'm very sort of early in the stages of it, so I don't know when they'll be ready. Um, and I also freelance as a learning and game designer. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me if you would like to collaborate on a project. Um, I, Ohio didn't actually work out, so I'm based in Stockholm, Sweden now, um, but I work with organizations around the world. So that's the end of my presentation, but I think I have time for questions, if anyone has any. Yes. Oh, right, microphone. Hi. Uh, did you at any point have a fear that this game could uh, turn into a sort of how-to for people who want to create fake news? And have you had any criticism 
directed at you uh, regarding that. Yes, absolutely. Both both of those things. So um, I that, that's the most common question I get as well. So I absolutely think this has probably been used by people to learn how to make fake news. But I think that many more people have played it and learned how to avoid fake news. Um, so the information that I use to sort of craft um, the process you go about using is available online. You can read articles about how to do this. You, you can research it on your own. And so it's not as if I was making new information available, but I definitely think that it's kind of fun. It's kind of like someone might be like, oh, I'm going to do this myself. I think it could happen. However, I am pro the democratization of information. And so I think if more people have access to this, it's probably ultimately a good thing. Any other questions? Yes. Did you have any other prior experience with game making other than you know teaching games uh, before making this game? Yes, yeah, so I had made some sort of simple educational games about business skills and things like that. Um, they've all been browser-based type games. Um, so I've worked on those, but it's always been sort of these small scale projects like this one that I've worked on. This, this is a free-to-play game, right? This is, pardon? It, this is a free-to-play game? Yes, absolutely. Free-to-play. Um, I don't profit from it. Um, that's the, the, it's just available because I care about this topic. So, But it is available for anyone to play online. Yes. Sorry. Uh, hi. You talked about the fact that, um, you know, we can all agree that fake news has an effect on society, especially on the internet where everyone seems to know every, everything about everything. Um, but, so, how important is the effect of fake news on politics? Because it's relatively easy for a really famous politician to cleanse the effect of fake news. So do you think it really has, you know, that strong impact on the larger scales, you know, politics, yeah? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's an open question, and I think there have been various studies by people who, who look at this um, more closely than I have, and most have concluded that, for example, fake news probably didn't tip the 2016 election. It was probably not the primary reason that, that Donald Trump won. However, it does impact people's opinions. It does have an effect. So that's something that I think should be studied more about, about how much impact it actually does have. But I think it's worthwhile addressing, and it's worthwhile thinking who is spreading what and why, and what various. I, I, if you look at like which articles tend to do best and which to spread, tend to spread further, I think people understanding that and sort of understanding what they're being exposed to, what other people are being exposed to, is worth w looking at more closely. So I kind of rambled off on that, but it's partially because it's not necessarily my background researching this. Um, is that close to answer? Yeah, awesome. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.